Hello, I'm Rachel Babin from Oncology News Australia, proud producers of the Oncology Journal Club podcast. Join Eva Segalov, Craig Underhill and Hans Prennan as they chat through the latest papers. This week, Craig asks, do you mind if I record? Hans is focused on cell-free DNA from bile and Eva talks us through the COVID capture study. You'll hear details on updated anti-emetic guidelines, patients' expectations of the benefits from genomic tumour testing and the importance of a warm welcome. In the paper that changed my practice segment, we hear from Nicola O'Neill, a young medical oncologist from yoga practicing in Perth. So join us for the most relaxed oncology education podcast. Reach out to us on Twitter using hashtag OJC. As ever, you'll find links to all of the papers, bios and Twitter handles in the notes on our website. For regular news and podcast updates, subscribe to the Oncology Newsletter on oncologynews.com.au. It's free and it's a great way to support the OJC. This is Rachel Babin and this is the Oncology Podcast. Hey, g'day, g'day, g'day. This is OJC episode 57. Can you believe it? I wonder if there's anyone in the audience who's listened to all 57. What do you think, Hans? I think maybe three people in Belgium probably listen to all 57. You, your wife and your mum. What about you, Craig Underhill? Well, I've listened to all 57. That's true. Yeah, and you often listen to, you know, to things twice. Oh, well, often while you're concentrating on recording, you don't necessarily take it all in. And I love when I'm out in the garden on the weekend to listen and, and go, oh, I didn't understand that when Eva was prattling on at the recording time and now I do. And so, you know, it's good. You can actually just enjoy it. And you listen when you're on your ride on mower. I That's do. so cool. Either that or Beyonce. Do you know uh, when you're on Beyonce? After I listen to the podcast, I usually listen to Beyonce. I thought when you're either on your riding on your mower or on Beyonce. <laughs> you you wish. Hans, do you know what a ride on mower is? Actually, no. Is it something to for the grass or? Yes. It's say because if you have a big lawn, you can't push the mower. Do you have Do you have a lawn, Hans, for the grass? Yes, but I push. Do you use scissors or? Yes. No, yeah. not scissors. No, he's so, being rude. So we've got a fairly <laughs> big backyard, so I do it on a right on mower. So it's very, when you think about it, it's. So it's like a mini tractor that you very, use. It. Very environmentally unsound because you're using fossil fuel to cut, to cut grass to make your yard look good. And so it should, and you water it to keep it green and all the rest of it. So it, it was actually on the, on the Belgian news that Australia is not doing that well for the climate. Oh yeah. Dig it in, dig it in. It's a, we are a disgrace, aren't we? A really a national embarrassment. Let's get on to some other news and try not to embarrass ourselves with some topics that we know. Your long paper, Hans. Yes, this week I was reading in uh, ASMO Open, as you know, the official journal of the ASMO, and I found one interesting paper from a Chinese group. It's published in October 2021, and it's called Cell-Free DNA from Bile, Outperformed Plasma as Potential Alternative to Tissue Biopsy in Biliary Tract Cancer. I found this quite interesting because we're focusing a lot on blood if we speak about circulating tumor DNA, and but some people have published data on urine, as you know, saliva, but not that many papers I've seen about bile. And actually, it's a quite good idea because it's something that is quite easily accessible, at least if you do an EOCP, for example. And these Chinese authors, they enrolled 28 patients in their study. Unfortunately, only tumor tissue available in eight and plasma and bile in 28 patients. So I don't really know why they didn't have tissue in the other 20 patients, but still they wanted mainly to compare the plasma with the bile and they could detect somatic mutations in 100% of the tissue. So the tissue seems to be still the best, which is not a surprise, of course. They found 71% in of bile cell-free DNA and 53% in plasma cell-free DNA. 
So the authors claim that actually, if you use bile cell-free DNA, it might be even better to detect mutations or alt- molecular alterations than to use plasma. And I think it's interesting in, in, because this field is evolving, as you know, especially in intrahepatic cholangiocarcinomas, we look for some fusions that can be targeted. But in this case, I think it's a first step, but maybe we should elaborate a little bit more on studies that look into the bile to detect maybe even these rare fusions. But to my knowledge, I haven't seen any paper about this. Well, that's great. And you're about to interview your good friend, Christiane Rolfo, again, who's now the head of the International Society for uh, Cell-Free DNA. Yeah, and I can ask him about the bile. It's it's, Mm. a good suggestion. Very interesting. And over to you, Craig. Well, even in a recent episode, we talked about communication school training and using EMR. So I kind of picked a paper along the same theme. So this is from Cancer for an American group. Do you mind if I record patients, oh, sorry, perceptions and practice regarding patient requests to record clinic visits in oncology? First author, Rachel Jimenez, senior author, Jeffrey Peppercorn. So there's lots of data and literature around patients' perception of and benefits for recording, but there's not a lot known about what the oncologists think. So they did a survey amongst medical radiation and surgical oncologists from five US cancer centers and community affiliates. They were surveyed to evaluate their experience, beliefs, and practices regarding patient-initiated recordings. They had a 69% response rate, which was, you know, one of the limitations, but it's not bad uh, for surveys amongst 360 oncologists. So it was skewed it a bit towards the academic centres where they have more time to do stuff like this. 93% had experienced patients seeking to record visits. 75% were comfortable, 25% uncomfortable. 56% report concerns ranging from less thorough discussions to legal liability. 85% always agreed when patients asked to record, but 15% never or selectively allowed recordings. One of the barriers is geographical heterogeneity amongst legality of recording and a lack of institutional policies regarding guidelines about recording. But the conclusion was that most oncologists were comfortable with patient requests to record visits, but a sizable minority remained uncomfortable. So I then, well, what's the state of play in our jurisdiction, Eva, which is in the state of Victoria in Australia? And true or false, it's illegal to for a patient to record without telling you. I think without telling you is probably true. No, false. It's not illegal. Oh. It's false. It's legal. I also looked it up indeed. Patient, if you have a conversation with somebody, then you give approval and they can record. They cannot sneak in and put some recording machine there when you're not there together with the patient. That's not allowed. No, but Craig just said it is allowed without consent. It is allowed, yeah. It It is is allowed if you're both there, if you're both in place and you can do it. Because if you speak with a patient, then you give consent. If you're speaking to them. Yeah. Even if and they then don't they can ask. Record, even they don't ask. Yes, yeah. I think that's actually true of any conversation. You can record a conversation while you are there, but you can't set something up to record beforehand and you can't record a third-person conversation that you're not part of. So this whole topic was tackled in a paper in the MJA, which we'll refer to. Oh, good, yeah. That was published in November last year from Dr. Megan Prichter and Dr. Carolyn Johnston from the Melbourne Law School, University of Melbourne, and Amelia Hyatt from the Cancer Experience Research at Peter McCallum Cancer Institute, comparing the legal implications of overt and covert recordings of healthcare consultations. So basically, yeah, in, in Victoria, you can they can do this covert recording, but it's not admissible in a medico-legal situation. Um, so potential solution, and this is something that's been validated and consented to by Peter McCallum board and executive, is this an app where both the patient and clinician and patient consent 
and they both get a copy. So that's one of the issues my understanding from my insurer well, it has been up until I've asked, you know, a couple of years ago, is that if the patient's going to record it, they have to provide you with a copy, which you need to store. So Peter Mac have this app, which the clinician and patient can consent to, and then they both get a copy of the consultation. Wow. Do they actually use it? I've never heard anyone talk about I've this. I've our colleagues talking about it. So, you know, it'd be interesting to ask them. And so anyone from Peter Max listening, when you've listened to it, can you sh- have a shout out to us on Twitter? I know there's quite a few who do listen, but I'll just point out some resources in there. So they've done actually done a whole lot of um, communication skills modules that cover this issue and people can download and listen to that. Oh, that's great. I mean, what about with telehealth as a, though? You, you know, that's a whole other aspect, that, isn't that it? That might make it easier, right? Because if you're using proprietary product, like I use a thing called CoView, which is encrypted. There's a waiting room. Patients are sent a link and they click on on their phone and there's an ability to record on that. So I think those, you know, if you set up a proper telehealth, not just on the phone, but on the through the web on a video, on a proper app, then there is the ability to record and I presume store the conversation. We don't always give the right information. Sometimes we have to ring the patient and say, look, I'm sorry, I was reading the wrong report or I think it might encourage people to say, I don't know a bit more, which would be yeah, good. That's right. um, and some of the interesting things just is that the older physicians, the older oncologists were more comfortable than the younger ones. So that was a bit counterintuitive. I would have thought they'd be fearing the technology, but in fact, they felt Maybe it was just from experience and uh, used to bullshitting that they um <laughs> Well, I mean, it, it raises the issue of whether you're going to do a different consultation if it's recorded than not recorded. And I think you'd be much more circumspect if it was recorded. And I think it will change the patient interaction. Obviously, if you don't know it's being recorded, it won't. But with the consent, I think it makes it a lot more formal So I think there's pros and cons, aren't there? Yeah. So basically clinicians did feel that it did make the discussion less natural. It changed the way they conveyed information. It could be distracting. So I guess, again, it's a learning curve and as you get used to doing it, uh, maybe some of those barriers are overcome. What happens if, like, they get to the end, they go, oh, I didn't press record. Can we do it again? <laughs> I can see that happening and it being terrible. Okay, great. Really good paper. Well, my main paper, I've got it, they're two companion papers. Uh, it's the CAPTCHA study that's now been published in Nature Cancer. And this is the big SARS CoV 2 infection immunization response in patients with cancer uh, being run out of the Marsden and the Crick and very proudly Lewis Au, who has gone to the Marsden following his training in Victoria is the second author. So these are two papers, one which looks at patients after uh, COVID infection and again one after vaccination There's about 500 patients. I won't go through all the details, but if you want some references for how do patients respond to the virus and to the vaccine, this is UK data. Now, of course, a plug for our own study, our CIROSNET study, we've got over 400 patients now on that study. And the differences with this CAPTCHA study is we've got a very low rate of COVID infection in our patients, whereas the UK has, you know, a significantly higher rate. And also our results are predominantly Pfizer. We do have an AZ group. We've also got kids 12 to 18 and about to enrol kids 5 to 11 when they're approved for vaccination. But really interesting detailed data and highly, highly important. So, Eva, in a nutshell, do they work? Do they actually work and do they last? So, very good questions. It depends who you are 
and what treatment you're on. There's a lot of concern for haematological patients. But then again, people are mainly uh, have been measuring neutralizing antibodies and all antibodies wane over time. T cell immunity is probably much more important. So in the group of patients who are on anti-CD20, you see no antibody response, but they do get a robust T cell response. How long does it last? No one knows. Of course, we're all now uh, giving a what's been called a third priming dose, so not a booster dose, causing a lot of confusion with patients because the general public are getting a booster dose six months after their second dose, but this is a third priming dose. And then it's anticipated that these patients will also get a booster dose if that is at six months post their third priming dose. And we got our first results just the other week looking at antibody responses after our first two doses. So I hope we also get in nature cancer, but uh, really great work. And of course, one other thing to say is uh, the vaccines work less well against the Delta variant and wear off, but it's really early days, but the data is looking like the third priming dose really is the one that gives you the prolonged and the real boost to the immunity. So you've had your third yeah, hands. Don't, don't talk to me about the third dose. Hans, did you have yours? And not yet, but they decided last weekend that uh, healthcare people will get their third dose, let's say, somewhere in November. So I had my third dose and I got really sick. Yeah, you're such a wuss. I had the man reaction. Oh, it was terrible. I had mine yesterday. It was fine. Yeah, well, you know, men get worse reactions than women and that's like a lot of things. Head surgery. (laughs) For vaccinating with a third dose, I'm quite surprised. Well, we think we're slow. You're just super slow. We've got a lot of people. I was seven months out as a healthcare worker. We were in the very first people vaccinated in Australia, along with nursing home residents. You must be more than six months out, though, Hans. Yeah, we were vaccinated in February, so yeah. Mm. Well, go and get your third dose quickly. So, Eva, I was going to do a quick bite and then I decided not to, but I decided I would just to reference paper in JAMA. So it's showing the importance of the vaccination. So there's some data about outcomes in cancer patients. So we've known for a while in other studies that cancer patients have worse outcomes, and this is confirming from a large database of half a million patients with COVID in the US. So they did confirm that if you've had recent chemotherapy that you do, you have worse outcomes. But the reason I rejected it, but now put it back in, is because it was done pre-vaccination era. So, but it is confirmatory evidence that without the vaccinations, you know, we still have hesitant cancer patients. And so this is strong data that they have double the risk of death, two and a half times the risk of death if they're on chemotherapy and unvaccinated compared to other patients. Yeah, and there's data, there's modelling, actually not data, but modelling to show even after vaccination, people on chemotherapy, this is a UK model, have about a four times increased risk if you catch COVID. A shout out to Ozsage and the working group that you and I sit on, Craig, about to release our cancer and immunosuppressed manifesto or paper for policymakers, ozsage.org, or follow us on Twitter at The Real Ozsage. We'll put both of those papers up. Yeah, um, it would be good because, you know, as I said, we still do have the occasional vaccine hesitant patient. And so there's um, some data that you can use to try and help convince them to go and get vaccinated if they're not already. So, Hans, your quick bite, please. Yes, actually, I selected one quick bite this week, and it's called Phase 1-2 Study of Cetuximab plus Pembrolizumab in Ras Wild-Type Metastatic Colon Cancer. So why did I select that paper? Because we always think adding immune therapy to everything that works will improve the efficacy. And we know that anti-GFR is working in Ras Wild-Type Metastatic Colon Cancer, And the authors thought, okay, maybe let's add pembrolizumab and the efficacy will be much higher. So patients were included. It's it's a very small group. It's 44 patients, metastatic colon cancer, second line or more. 
published in Clinical Cancer Research, October 2021. And just to be brief, it's a negative study, response rate quite low, 2.6%, and six months PFS of 31%. So the only slight positive thing is that they saw local immunologic effects, So when, which means there was an increase in T-cells post-treatment, so the immune therapy is doing something, but it doesn't always reflect into increased efficacy. So I think negative studies are also important to discuss on this podcast. Yes, particularly if you want to talk about tar- molecularly targeted therapies in colorectal cancer. <laughs> A few negative studies as opposed to Craig's lung cancer studies and breast cancer and melanoma and everything else taking off. Okay, so I've got a couple of quick bites. The first is Supportive Care in Cancer have published the new mask anti-emetic guidelines. So I think they're a must read. Second one, this was a lovely one, a letter in the Journal of Geriatric Oncology last year, and it's called, I love the title, Satisfaction with Hospital Care in Older Patients with Colorectal Cancer, comma, the Importance of a Warm Welcome. And they found, particularly amongst elderly people, it was the welcome that they got from the reception staff that had a stronger association with satisfaction than their opinion about the doctors and the nurses or their overall satisfaction. And the conclusion was a friendly and helpful attitude is a major component of how older patients perceive their overall hospital care. That's a fantastic paper, Eva, yeah? Yeah. Look, you're only as good as your front desk staff and everybody at the moment, particularly in Australia with a little COVID wave or not so little, is frazzled and people are wearing PPE. They're hot and bothered. We're about to come into summer. And, you know, if you're just not that friendly, it will turn people away and particularly discriminates, I think, against older people. So a good reminder for all of us And I like the paper that is looking at reception staff or or first people who greet the patients. What do you think, Craig? Yeah, good. Really good. I'm going to send it to our practice manager. Yes, I thought a few people might want to reference that. Another quick bite, time-related burdens of cancer care. This was an editorial in JCOOP referencing an article by Limit Al in the Annals of Surgical Oncology. And it was an interesting paper because we've heard all about financial toxicity and now we're coming into this issue of time toxicity. So they looked at a 107 patients who were having a curative resection for pancreatic adenocarcinoma at a single US centre. Median overall survival was 17.5 months. And they said patients on average had healthcare contact within the same health service on 11% of those days. And they divided into how many days they were in surgery and in care and medical oncology and radiology and travel time. But there's a ballpark figure, 10 or 11% of your remaining life is spent engaging in interactions with healthcare. Mm, Interesting to do this from a physician point of view, Eva. What do you mean? What was the time toxicity? So we could add recording podcasts, preparing for <laughs> podcasts. Preparing for podcasts, yes. I wonder uh, how much time toxicity hands would have compared to us. Huge. Reading science, it takes a lot longer. In, there, in that paper about regional patients, Eva, because that would be interesting because, of course, they there'd be – some regional patients that have to travel for hours to centres. There's others that, like in our own, patients are in some ways lucky. They're 10 minutes down the road and can park at the front. Patients in the city might have to now drive for an hour and a half, negotiate car parks, etc. So that travel time is a significant thing and probably overall worse for regional. Well, this is a US study. They did say the median one-way travel time, so obviously you go more than one way, was 30 minutes, so it's an hour. Uh, But they did show disparity, non-white race 
and people with more comorbidities had greater time toxicity. So, you know, we are asking a lot of people, come here for a blood test, come here for a, for your scans, come and see us. We're taking up 10% of their remaining life after a, a curative resection for pancreatic cancer. And that's why I think post-pandemic telehealth is still going to be have a role, isn't it? Because sometimes it's a quick touch base or, you know, giving a result that was expected that, you know, instead of someone having to drive in to see you face-to-face, you could do that over a video link. Absolutely. Over to you for your quick bites this yeah. week. Thanks, Eva. So just following on from that discussion on the regional thing, this is one you flicked to me. So thank you for pointing this paper out to me. Patient expectations of benefits from large panel genomic tumour testing in rural community oncology practices. This was a survey done in 1,139 patients in a range of tumour types from regional areas in the US, and they basically showed the patients have high expectations that they would benefit from genomic testing and generally had positive attitudes, but they had a relatively poor knowledge Interestingly, the greater expectations were associated with lower knowledge, more positive attitudes and lower education. So the sort of lower socioeconomic and health literacy had an, had an impact and more research is needed to understand the concordance between expectations and actual clinical outcomes. So I think, you know, we have a risk of overselling the benefits of genome testing. You know, how often does it come back and there's no actionable mutation? And you get some interesting comments. One of my colleagues pointed out to me recently he had a patient who refused to have a free genomic testing because he was worried it might affect the superannuation policy and insurance of his children because he didn't understand it was testing the genes of the tumour rather than him. But he was worried about you know finding a BRCA mutation or something like that. So anyway, interesting. Quick one, quick bite. New ASCO guidelines are managing adverse reactions from immunotherapy. So they've been updated. When you will reference that paper, I couldn't understand in the paper. They didn't really explain very well what had been changed. But in summary, for the GI doctors who don't use much IO, you know, for grade one tox, you keep going and monitor. Grade two, you may need to pause and add in a milligram to two milligrams per kilogram of PRED. Grade three, you need to stop and add in probably intravenous steroids. And there's some discussion about whether to be able to re-challenge and then grade four, you know, let's take the patient off the treatment. So good guidelines. If your department or on your, you know, your own computer, you, you store these guidelines and reference them. The ASCO has been updated. And then the last quick bite, it's the focus for study. Cape Cytovine versus active monitoring in stable or responding metastatic colorectal cancer after 16 weeks of first-line therapy results of the randomized FOCUS-4 trial. So, you know, the standard of care has become three-weekly capecitabine and BEV on the basis of the Cairo-3 and AIO-0207 studies, which showed a non-significant overall survival, but significant progression-free survival benefit. So this was a randomized study done in 254 patients in multiple centres in the UK, and they again showed a progression-free survival advantage, no difference in quality of life, and no difference in overall survival. Eva, you would know better than me, because you're I'm only an associate professor and you're a full professor, but my concern was in a study of 254 patients, is that really powered to show an overall survival difference. So if you look at the stats in the paper, the total of 644 patients would provide 80% power of detecting a hazard ratio of 0.8 at the two side of 5% significance level. But because of the pandemic, they closed the recruitment early. So can they really conclude after only about a third of the patients are on the study that this is the definitive answer to the question? Well, the question's been looked at before, of course, in the Cairo set of studies with exactly the same answers. So I think they would have done, a, you know, a statistical adjustment and uh, futility analysis as well. So I think it's great data. It's, 
you know, what we would expect is predicated on patients going back on treatment when they've progressed, which is sometimes not uh, easy to convince someone because they're having a good time off their uh, treatment. But I think we need more of these studies. So again, would it ch- do you think it's going to change practice? I think it should. I hope it does. But you know, again, you could always find individual reasons, but I think we're treating patients with colorectal cancer for with doublet or triplet therapy for much shorter periods of time. Very few go through to six months. Um, we drop to maintenance, and this is an argument for a total treatment break. Yeah, interesting data. Have you got an amazing article of the week? I'm sure you do. I do. I do. I do. I have one from the Journal of Applied Psychology, and recently published. How do you find these things? Ah, look for these amazing articles. It's called Cross-Lagged Effects of Voluntary Job Changes and Wellbeing, a Continuous Time Approach. And what they looked at is, are you better off changing your job voluntarily or staying where you are? And the bottom line is that when people leave for a new job, they found on average that satisfaction and energy drops for over a year and the sense of belonging goes down and actually work-family conflict increases. Wow. So this is a grass is not uh, greener. Very interesting. I wonder if that would hold up in the healthcare uh, uh, system. It wasn't necessarily done in healthcare workers or oncology setting. It was right across job. So changing your job, like getting married, moving house, a close family member dying, I mean, they're on those like major stresses. This was, it was an Australian study using a survey called the Household Income and Labor Dynamics in Australia. So yes, we'd, we'd want to do one in our own setting, but you know, in Australia, people don't tend to change their jobs very often in in our uh, specialties. I remember when I uh, decided to come to Melbourne from Sydney, there was great shock. And as opposed to America and Europe, where people move around in academia, at least a lot more than, than in Australia. So there you go. I thought you'd enjoy that one. So now we've got a special treat because we were calling for people to contact us if they wanted to be on our paper that changed my practice or a paper that changed my life, as uh, Merv thought it was. And the Young Oncology Group of Australia rallied, and we have a whole lot of uh, volunteers from yoga who are going to tell us about the paper that changed their practice over the next uh, few episodes. So very welcome. Here's our first one. Very pleased to have here with me Nicola O'Neill, also from Yoga, from the Young Oncology Group Australia. And Nicola, tell us what paper did you select for the paper that changed my practice? Um, So I have selected a paper published in Lancet Oncology in 2002 by Professor Martin Tattersall and Professor Phyllis Butto entitled Consultation Audio Tapes, an Underused Cancer Patient Information Aid and Clinical Research Tool. And so what's it about? It's a quite old paper, 2002. Yeah. So essentially the paper expands on previous research done by Professor Tattersall and Professor Butto um, in which they looked at patients' um, decision-making process and particularly in oncology patients, um, patients must understand, evaluate and retain complex information. And a lot of their previous evidence suggests that patients, particularly when faced with bad news in our initial consultation, may find it difficult to remember what they were told, they can feel overwhelmed and they can switch off. Furthermore, patients often demonstrate poor recall of information presented in this consultation um, with their previous research suggesting that 40 to 80% of this information is forgotten immediately. And the greater the amount of information is presented, the lower the proportion is correctly recalled. And almost half of the information that is remembered is unfortunately incorrect. And so a lot of research has been done um, looking at methods to enhance the transfer of medical information, um, including the use of audio tapes. So that was historically what was used, but now we can use iPhones and modern phones to take consultations letters to patients um, and written information, and these have been shown to be economical and time efficient. 
So the paper I chose was a meta-analysis of the published research looking at the use of consultation audio tapes as an information aid for patients with cancer and as a research tool to study the communication between doctors and patients. It included eight randomised trials and one previous systematic review. And generally, the overall consensus was that 83 to 96% of patients said that the recordings of the initial consultation were valuable. Um, With better information recall, there was better satisfaction with the consultation. And in the studies that did assess it, it did not increase any anxiety to the patient or their family members. They also looked at the use of audio tapes in follow-up consultations, so not just the initial consultation. And a lot of patients found it very useful, particularly in those who English was not their first language, with 81% of patients uh, listening to the tape and 68% playing it to someone else, and most commonly that person was a spouse. Um, 75% of these patients said the tape was useful, aided in their understanding, and did not cause any anxiety. And the patients reported that the tape provided a good record for them, was useful information, enhanced the doctor-patient relationship, and particularly was useful for those patients whose English was not their first language. I think it's it's a super interesting paper and still very relevant, but now we're almost yeah, 18, 19 years later. So I think it's time that you write an update with current informatics, current social media, current iPhones to see what current status, because I think we discussed also that some patients record what yeah, what, what uh, oncologist is telling, even without the oncologist knowing whether this is legal or not legal. So I think it's a very relevant topic at the moment. And uh, maybe you should write, maybe talk to Eva Segalov and she will tell you that you should write a paper about it. <laughs> yeah, no, definitely. And I think particularly in the COVID era, this paper is even more relevant where patients are expected to attend appointments by themselves. And so I found this to be really useful. Thanks a lot, Nicola. Very useful paper. Thanks a lot. Thank you. So another great OJC, at least in our own minds. I love it. Thanks, Hans. Thanks, Eve. I really enjoyed it. And thank you, Craig. Thanks, Eva. Thanks, Hans. Thanks, Rachel. And most of all, thanks to all our listeners out there. Bye for now. You've been listening to The Oncology Podcast. If you enjoyed today's edition and would like to subscribe, head over to our website, oncologynews.com.au, and sign up to our newsletter. Thanks for listening.